Welcome to Brookings. My name is Ron Haskins, along with Richard Reeves, a gentleman to my right, not politically, but to my right. Uh, and I co-direct a center here called the Center on Children and Families, uh, which we are extremely pleased to do. Um, and we're pleased to be holding this event as well about an old policy idea, which is often called the Children's Allowance, a species of guaranteed annual income, uh, with some new twists. Uh, and why would be concerned about a children's allowance, the idea of giving a guaranteed cash benefit to families? And I think there, there are a lot of reasons, but I think two are predominant. One has always been a, a good reason to do it, and that is that it costs a lot of money to raise a child, at least a quarter million dollars. The estimates vary greatly. Wealthy families spend more and so forth, but it, it is a lot of money to raise children. And they're the future of society, so it makes sense that we would subsidize families to try to compensate them for the money that they have to spend for children, because without kids, we wouldn't have a future. The second reason, more recent in origin, and an issue of some debate, maybe we'll have some today about that, and that is that since welfare reform in 96, there has been an accumulation of, especially single women, uh, but people at the bottom of the income scale who do not have any cash benefit at all. Uh, and these families are extremely poor, deep poverty has risen and so forth. And so there's a real concern that we need a way to get money to that group of families. And of course, these are all laid out in the papers and presumably mentioned by various of the participants, both the speakers uh, and the reactants. So the goal to keep all, make sure that all American families have a cash income, uh, not just low income families, but all families, and by the way, we'll talk about this later, I'm pretty sure, but uh, very good modeling shows that even if you finance it by ending the child tax credit and the $4,000 child exemption, that there's still virtually no losers. That everyone would still have uh, more than they have now, especially if the benefit were set at around $250 a month. Uh, so here's our uh, plan for the event. As soon as I get through talking, Jane Walpole will come up and speak for an hour or so, maybe. Yeah. Um, and it'll all be very important, so take notes rapidly. Uh, Jane is the, this will take three minutes to tell you her title, Compton <laughs> Foundation Centennial Professor of Social Work for the Prevention of Children's and Youth Problems at Columbia. Pretty good, huh? Good. It's a good thing I had it written down. Jane can't even say it yet without reading it. Uh, and I think it's safe to say, for those of you who follow this uh, world, uh, that Jane is one of the biggest stars in the world of social policy. She's truly amazing and has a spectacular career. Um, and then when she gets done, we'll leave and we'll turn it over to Richard in panel one. Uh, and they're going to talk about the context, some of the issues that I just discussed, but other things as well. Uh, Richard will chair that panel and he'll introduce the speakers at the appropriate time. Uh, then we are going to present two actual plans. Uh, for uh, what a child allowance would actually look like and how much it might cost. And hopefully we'll even say something, maybe the reactants will, about offsetting the costs uh, of these plans. And Aparna Mather from AEI, uh, a resident scholar there, will chair that panel and she'll introduce the panelists at the appropriate time. And then we're going to conclude the event with two keynote talks, uh, one by Robert Dorr of AEI, whom I'll introduce at the appropriate time, uh, and the other one by Rosa Delero, who will be introduced uh, by um, Jared Bernstein. Uh, and then uh, we'll have an uh, uh, opportunity for the audience to ask questions for all the panelists and for the, both the speakers and the reactants. Uh, and then after uh, that last keynote speech, we will adjourn and have some adult beverages and snacks uh, for people who can stay around for a while. So with that, Jane. Thank you, Ron. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to join Ron in welcoming all of you here today. And I know um, we both want to thank uh, the people who supported uh, this conference today. So that would be the three poverty centers, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Columbia, and also the Annie E. Casey Foundation. And I hope I haven't forgotten anybody in terms of funders. OK, it looks like I haven't. Um, I also want to thank Ron and his staff here at Brookings for being such good hosts. They've been really uh, tremendous to work with in organizing this conference. So this comes at an opportune time. Um, we first began talking about this event a few years ago when we realized that 2017 would be the 50th anniversary of the first conference on a universal child allowance. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now, some of you may not have been here for that first conference 50 years ago, but there was such a conference. It was held at HEW, and it was organized by our former colleagues at Columbia School of Social Work, Evelyn Burns, who was very active in the founding of Social Security, and Al Khan. Um, so we're following up on that, on that earlier conference. Um, uh, e already back then in 1967, many of our peer countries had a universal child allowance. And over the ensuing 50 years, universal child allowances have become a core element of a modern safety net and one that helps substantially to reduce the risk of child poverty. Countries as varied as Austria, Canada, Denmark, Finland, France, Germany, Ireland, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, and the UK all have a universal or near universal child allowance. Providing a cash benefit to all families with children, regardless of family income or employment, typically paid monthly, these universal child allowances provide a cash floor that helps protect children from shocks and fluctuations in their parents' employment or income. The level of the allowance, the amount, varies by country. In Germany and Belgium, the, be the benefit for two children is about $5,600 per year. In Ireland, it's about $4,000. In the Netherlands, it's about $2,400. In Canada, following recent reforms, families may now receive up to $6,400 per child under age 6 and up to $5,400 for a school-age child age 6 to 17 depending on your family income. We know from the UK that expansions of their child allowance and their child tax credits in the late 1990s and early 2000s helped cut child poverty in half if measured on an absolute poverty line as we do in the United States. The recent Canadian reforms are projected to do the same, to also cut child poverty in half. It's important to note that these allowance amounts are in addition to the universal health care and the low-cost, high-quality child care and preschool that these countries provide. Uh, so they're intended to help cover the costs of other necessities for children, educational goods like books and toys, as well as material goods like housing, food, clothing, and even diapers. So when we first started talking about today's conference a few years ago, we thought we would be introducing or maybe reintroducing the idea of a universal child allowance to U.S. policymakers, especially those who weren't around 50 years ago for that first conference. But over the past few years, actually, the idea of a universal child allowance has been garnering quite a bit of interest and attention in Washington and elsewhere in the U.S. and from several parts of the political spectrum. So today we're going to be showcasing two particularly prominent proposals, but there are also others. So this seems like an ideal time to come together and talk about the case for a universal child allowance, hear about two current proposals, and engage in a discussion of the feasibility, costs, and benefits. So thank you all for joining us, and uh, let's go into the first session. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. Thank you Ron. Uh, as Ron says, I'm the co-director of the Center on Children and Families. I'd like to add my welcome to all of you in the room, but also those of you who are joining us uh, on the uh, live web stream. Um, some people are unable to make it or are watching from around the country, and I just want you to know if you're watching online that you are almost as welcome as the people who've come, very nearly as welcome <laughs> as the people who are physically in the room. Uh, and also, those who are on social media, uh, please, if you're going to tweet, please use the hashtag child allowance to draw more attention to the event. Um, it's probably obvious by now that I'm from the UK, which Jane just mentioned. Uh, in fact, with three children um, who were being raised in the UK, had a universal child benefit for all three of those children. I was then part of the coalition government that removed that universal child benefit, thereby making it not universal, for higher rate taxpayers. Um, as part of an attempt to save money, and shortly after that, I left and came to the US. So I'm not suggesting causality, but I am just reporting the facts. Um, what I'm going to do is introduce a whole panel. We have two presentations and two panelists, and then we can uh, move things along quite quickly. So you're going to first uh, hear from Kathy Eden, who is sitting two to my right, uh, as, you, as you look. Um, she is the Bloomberg Distinguished Professor in the Department of Sociology at Johns Hopkins, and seems to write a book roughly once a year, um, the last two are coming of age in the other America and $2 a day living on almost nothing in America. And she's going to open proceedings with her presentation on problems with the current U.S. safety net. 
Uh, after hearing from Cathy, we're going to hear from Bonnie McLeod, who is uh, to my immediate right as you look at the stage, who is U at AC Thomas Collegiate Professor of Psychology at the University of Michigan. One note, by the way, is that these job titles are getting longer for everybody. Um, and uh, Bonnie's going to present on why money matters. Um, and I should have mentioned that she's also an associate editor of American Psychologist. Uh, on your uh, far left uh, is CLASP's executive director, Olivia Golden. She's a former fellow at the Urban Institute and served for eight years in the federal government as the Commissioner for Children, Youth, and Families, and then as Assistant Secretary for Children and Families at the uh, US Department of Health and Human Services. And then last, and on the far right, as you look at the stage, this is purely a physical description, not a political one, is uh, Ramesh Panuru, who is Senior Editor for National Review, a columnist at Bloomberg View. So that's two mentions of Bloomberg from one panel, so he's definitely getting his money worth. Uh, a visiting fellow at the, uh, the American Enterprise Institute and a senior fellow at the National Review Institute. So with no further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Kathy with her presentation. Kathy Eden. So the 20th anniversary of welfare reform has drawn renewed attention to uh, this landmark piece of legislation passed just a little over 20 years ago. And uh, the question that's come up over and over again is, did it succeed or fail? So. I live in Baltimore, and I do so so that I'm not actually inside of the Beltway, and I can, can still think straight. But uh, I've heard this is a city of simple answers. Uh, so I'm going to resist the temptation to give one. If by uh, welfare reform we include the broad changes to the safety net we saw in the 1990s and into the 2000s, uh, the expansion of the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, a health insurance for poor children called SCHIP, a SNAP, our food stamp program expanded, of course, uh, um, by uh, Bush II. Uh, then I think the answer to the question of what, whether welfare reform succeeded or failed must be both. So let's talk about the success side of the ledger. And I, I want to point out that I wrote a book about this uh, with Sarah Halper, Meek, and Laura Tuck, and Jen Seit. Sarah's the first author. Uh, so I do write optimistic books. It's called It's Not Like I'm Poor. But uh, in that book, we chronicle a remarkable success of the 90 reforms, uh, the expansion of the EITC that made good on the promise that if you work, you shouldn't be poor. This is a remarkable achievement. And we managed to do it, and this is really the theme of our book, in a way that virtually consecrated these hard-pressed working parents as citizens. So I first sort of caught, caught wind of how profound this change had been when uh, field work uh, took me to the East Boston. I was following around EITC recipients to figure out how they spent the money. Uh, ended up in East Boston. Uh, I just stumbled upon this old uh, Dickensian building, uh, you know, kind of encrusted with 100 years of soot. Uh, uh, wire mesh over the windows, uh, uh, both brass, le brass letters and carved in to the facade of the building were the words, overseers of the public welfare. Uh, to me, this was such a powerful symbol of the stigma and shame that had accompanied that, that, that program. Uh, it was almost as if you had to trade away your citizenship uh, to get relief. Uh, so imagine uh, my, my shock when I then uh, tour, went down Bennington Street and uh, arrived at the local H&R Block, where, of course, about 70% of EITC claimants uh, fill out their tax reforms and actually uh, collect their checks. Uh, and uh, standing there with my colleagues wearing sandwich boards to get them to participate in our study, uh, people would come out after giving H&R Block $200 to file their taxes, saying things like, I've got people, or I feel like a real American. Even, I feel proud to be a taxpayer. Now, my financial advisor tells me I shouldn't be you know, paying as many taxes as I am. Uh, so I've never really felt proud to be a taxpayer, but these, these testaments uh, of citizenship were just unexpected and really remarkable in our work. And, and we didn't just expand the EITC, we also made it easier for children of working parents to stay on Medicaid, and we made it easier for them to get on SNAP. So I think we can argue that one of the legacies of the working poor is that, uh, of welfare reform, is that the working poor are, at least in terms of money, arguably better off than at any time 
uh, in American history as long as they work full time, full year. Okay, that's enough optimism. Uh, what about the, the failure part? Uh, of course, I like talking about that more. Um, but let me start by saying something about the literature. Uh, Laura Tuck and I have just reviewed all of the literature on welfare reform over the last 20 years for the annual review, and it is amazing how good it looked at the beginning. Right? Lots of researchers, including myself, were looking at welfare reform in the 90s, right? And two things were happening that made us really optimistic. Welfare rolls were falling, dependency was decreasing, right? And labor force attachment was increasing. Now, somehow after 2000, researchers lost interest in welfare reform, except for a few notable exceptions. And so we failed to notice that after the late 1990s, we no longer saw this crisscross of trends, but instead, two things were going in the same direction. Welfare rolls continued to fall, and so did labor force participation. So here's what we didn't understand about welfare reform. First, it was not a stroke of a pen. Instead, it was a dynamic force. Now, there are two features of TANF that led to that dynamism. First, we ended the entitlement. Second, we gave it to states as in the form of a block grant with little oversight. Now, we all like to think of states as laboratories of democracy, myself included. Innovation can be very good. But instead, it became, uh, and I'm gonna use a strong term here purposely, uh, really almost an opiate for the states, an irresistible, flexible funding stream, uh, to use uh, Peter the Citizen's term, uh, I call it a slush fund because I like to, uh, you know, call a spade a spade. Uh, but, you know, w when governors wanted to give goodies away, they couldn't afford, like Michigan's college scholarship program, there was the TANF block grant. Uh, when states found themselves needing to fill budget holes, this happened, I believe, just last year in South Carolina uh, with uh, expenditures on child welfare, there was TANF. Uh, and state governors could also look good by giving more help, sort of piling on to this help for those noble working poor. And uh, in the end, what we've seen is a virtual collapse of the TANF program in several states. In virtually every state in the nation, it is only a shadow of its former self. And uh, we've, we've essentially seen this rising inequality among the poor. Uh, the second thing we didn't understand is that the late the 90s economy, the late 90s economy, wouldn't last forever. It remains true that today's bad jobs are just much, much worse than the bad jobs of the late 1990s when welfare reform was looking so good. Uh, there's now a rising literature on the fissuring of the workplace, which has led uh, to worsening income volatility among the poor who are mostly in and out of the labor market now, rather than stably uh, either in or either out. So let's look at a few pictures. This is the decline in the TANF caseload among eligibles. As you can see, it's quite stark. Uh, but what I want to point out is in our field work, you may know that Luke and I, Lou Schaefer, who's in the back, and I uh, wrote a book last year called $2 a Day, The Rise of uh, the Number of Americans Living on Virtually Nothing in America. Uh, and this was both a, an, an exercise in numbers and in ethnography. Uh, but as we were following actual people over many months and years in this situation, we were struck by the fact that when hard times came, in most cases, it didn't even occur to people to knock at TANF's door. TANF was dead in the imaginations of the poor. Second, here's how states are spending their TANF dollars. What we see is this diversion by states, uh, very little, by the way, expe uh, expended uh, for work-related activities, and the largest single category, of course, for other areas, oftentimes to fill uh, budget holes or uh, to, for governors to give away goodies. So there's less to the poorest, Right? This is the, really the story of welfare reform, less to the poorest, 
more uh, to what my colleague Robert Moffat calls the, the shallow poor uh, and uh, to, the, to the near poor. So in some, we've seen a reconfiguring of a safety net. And Laura Tuck and I, in our annual review piece, argue that this is really a redrawing of the line of deservedness uh, with work as the new litmus test for citizenship. Now, this has led to harsh consequences among the poor. We see the rise in extreme poverty. These are figures from the CPS. You know, our original estimates were point-in-time estimates from the SIP. Uh, these are from the CPS. The reason we use the CPS is because you can correct at least somewhat for underreporting. You may recall in our original estimates, uh, we report a roughly a doubling in $2 a day poverty. Here you see among all families with children an increase of about three times. Now, if we limit our estimates just to single mothers, those most likely to be affected by welfare reform, we see a much larger increase from about 900,000 to about 90,000 to 700,000 in 2012. If you don't believe surveys, we can turn to SNAP data. Uh, these are the number of SNAP households reporting uh, that they have virtually no, they have literally zero income when they apply for SNAP or they go back for recertification. Now, I will say something about this chart. When we plot this against our original estimates from the survey of income and program participation, uh, it, there is an eerie correspondence between this line and our estimates, except at the end of the series, when what you see from the food stamp program is much more dire than what our, our SIP estimates uh, indicate. So, hmm, what could be going on there? And I showed that slide uh, in an audience where Irv Garfinkel and Jane Waldfogel were, and they immediately said, oh, that's got to be child homelessness. So indeed, uh, since about 2004, states have been required, schools have been required to report on the number of students that are uh, either homelessness, homeless or unstably housed. And we see uh, that when states were kind of more or less reliably reporting, uh, there's been a huge income. And we'll, we'll come back to this in a minute. So does it matter? Does it matter that the cash safety net has all but collapsed in many of our states? Chris Winship, uh, my friend and a former, uh, I think former student, but maybe we didn't quite overlap, uh, says, look at all this Medicaid, right? Robert Rector said, well, the poor have cell phones. Now, Ray McCormick from $2 a day actually has Medicaid, although it doesn't pay for many of her medications. And she has a cell phone. I hear from her almost every day. So how do we you know, think about that given the fact that she had no heat this winter? How do we think about that when we consider the fact uh, that her lights and her water were routinely cut off? Uh, her daughter, Azara, turned six five days before Christmas. Ray had no money for a cake, nor did Azara get any Christmas or birthday presents from her family. So how do we think of these two things together? And I argue that it's actually important to do that. I think these are good questions to be asking. I put it to you that we cannot adjudicate these claims unless we turn to direct measures of well-being like student homelessness. Some others that might be important are low birth weight, out-of-home placements, food security, and so on. Uh, but when Luke and I looked in uh, to the data, we used state-by-year fixed effects. I'm an ethnographer, so I had to practice that, uh, even more than I have to practice my title. Uh, we found that for every 100 case decline in the TANF caseload within a state, we saw 16 more kids homeless or unstably housed. So just a little taste of that well-being research. Now, TANF may be dead, but that's all the more reason to consider other ways to get a cash floor under our most vulnerable and least culpable citizens, our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, and next, Bonnie, who's going to speak on why money matters. 
And you think, yeah, it should just come straight up to you, Ronnie. There okay. you go. Yes. The, the issue of why money matters um, to children's development is best addressed uh, by the voluminous body of research on the effects of poverty and economic stress on children's development. This research is informed by three perspectives, the first focusing on investment, the second focusing on family stress, and the third focusing on environmental stress. Uh, I want to try to present some major findings relevant to each of these perspectives, and I want to encompass findings um, from correlational research as well as experimental research. Experimental research in which families or individuals are assigned to random controls, are assigned randomly to control or experimental or treatment groups is critically important in estimating the extent to which the association between family income and child outcomes is causal. But these studies have the problem of they often tell us very little about the processes that are involved in that relationship. Whereas correlational research has the opposite limitation in that it, it often, it's, it's purposely focused on trying to understand the processes that, are, that account for the link between income and children's development. Um, but of course, the limitation of these studies is that they are susceptible to biases um, from un unmeasured parent and family characteristics, uh, as well as biases from di bi-directional influences of children on their parents. The most rigorous correlational research and research that I will give most weight to in my overview uses longitudinal studies, longitudinal design, statistical controls for confounding parent and family characteristics and controls for the initial level of the child outcome variable. So the investment um, perspective essentially argues that children from poor families lag behind their economically advantaged counterparts in terms of their cognitive development and academic achievement, in part because their parents have fewer resources to invest in them. So they are less able to purchase inputs for their children, including books and educational materials at home, high quality childcare, and other experiences that are associated with cognitive um, development and academic achievement. Um, Economically disadvantaged parents may also have less time to invest in their children because they are more likely to be single parents, more likely to have non-standard work hours, uh, and less flexible work schedules. And all of these factors uh, be, have the effect of reducing parent-child uh, contact. So what do we know about uh, what does the exper non-experimental longitudinal research tell us about this? Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, there are very, very robust links between family income, quality of, child, of the child's home environment, and cognitive functioning. And there's very strong evidence that the, the link between income and children's cognitive functioning is mediated through um, home environment, the uh, level of cognitive stimulation in the home. Um, so there, there are many, many studies that document these links, um, co correlational research. Um, what's perhaps more important and what I want to emphasize is what we have, the evidence that we have from experimental research. Uh, experimental research does point to causal effects of family income during early childhood on children's academic achievement. So there were many welfare and anti-poverty experiments in the United States in the 1990s, and some of those experiments were experimental uh, earning supplement programs. And those programs, um, without exception, increased children's academic achievement. But again, we don't know from those studies um, what the mediating processes are, are. So these are studies that had random assignment, they had treatment and control groups, and we consistently see that those children who were in families that um, had earnings supplements that brought the earnings of the family, the income of the families above poverty level, had subsequent increases in their academic achievement. 
Uh, we also have some evidence uh, from quasi-experimental research. And essentially, the studies that capitalize on the natural variation in policy implementation suggest causal effects of income on children's school achievement. So I think here's a case where you can begin to make causal uh, statements um, even when families are not randomly assigned to treatment and control groups. So we saw increases in low-income children's achievement and educational attainment coinciding with increases in the uh, EITC. Likewise, in Canada, when family income increased due to an increase in the child tax credit, low-income children's math and vocabulary scores increased. Um, so I think, I, I think it's very clear that there is a causal link between income and children's cognitive development and their achievement um, outcomes. Um, the other thing I want to emphasize is, because it's relevant to the proposal that we'll be discussing today, is that there is pretty strong evidence that the timing of family economic conditions matters, such that economic conditions prior, experienced prior to the age of five, compared to economic conditions experienced after the age of five, um, are strongly associated with children's complete schooling, academic outcomes, adult earnings, and adult uh, hours, uh, work hours during adulthood. So economic conditions seem to be much more important for children's outcomes if, when we're looking at economic conditions that existed prior to the age of five. And these stronger effects of income in early childhood are consistent with growing evidence of the uh, developing, that the developing brain is more sensitive to environmental influences in the first few years of life. And they're very consistent with this idea that early skills provide a key foundation for later skill acquisition. So let me turn to the family stress pers perspective, the second perspective. Um, this is a perspective that essentially says, Family income matters because of the impact that it has on children's economic, children's uh, parents' mental health functioning, the impact that it has on marital and co-parenting relationships, and ultimately the impact that it has on the quality of parenting. Um, so from this perspective, children living in families with inadequate income and unstable income are more likely to experience internalizing, externalizing problems through these cascading processes whereby insufficient or unstable income creates economic pressure as parents struggle to pay bills. This economic pressure creates psychological distress in parents that spills over into marital and co-parenting relationships, leading to lower quality parenting, distinguished by harsh punitive, inconsistent, and detached parenting that in turn creates uh, socio-emotional difficulties for the child. Um, I would say in general that there is stronger, more consistent support for these direct links articulated by this family stress model than there is for the entire mediational process that's hypothesized by this model. Um, Secondly, I want to emphasize that the amount of family income generally is more strongly re related to children's cognitive development and academic achievement than uh, it is to children's socio-emotional development. But we also know that decreases in family income and unstable income is linked to a whole host of negative outcomes, greater psychological distress among parents, disruptions in family routines, decreases in cognitive stimulation in the home, increased school absences, et cetera. Um, in terms of experimental research, um, again, referring to the er experimental earning supplement programs in the US, those programs, some of those programs, improve children's positive behavior and reduce behavioral problems, some, but not all, in contrast to the effect that these programs had on children's academic functioning. All of them had positive effects on children's academic functioning. Um, 
And in terms of the, what we know from, about mediating processes, the experimental earning supplement programs, while they had, some of them had positive effects on children's positive behavior and reduced behavioral problems, they don't tell us much, uh, anything really, that about uh, what mediated those effects. So there was no consistent evidence that parent well-being, parenting practices, or family relations mediated these effects. Um, next, I want to move to an environmental stress perspective. Essentially, this perspective is a broader view of stress. I mean, the family stress model has been criticized uh, for focusing just on family stress. Um, critics say, you know, poor children um, uh, inhabit physical settings that are problematic in, in, in many ways. Uh, they are exposed to uh, a daunting array of stressful conditions, not just family conflict, but food insecurity, dangerous neighborhoods, inadequate housing, poor child care, high, le high levels of noise, high levels of crowd crowding. Uh, so they're exposed to these stressful conditions and stressful events, and str these stressful events are often contagious. One stressor leads to another, leads to another. Um, so the environmental stress perspective formulated by uh, developmental psychologists and neuroscientists is seen as a corrective to the narrow focus on family stress. And this broader perspective holds that family income matters to children's health and development because it affects the level of exposure that children have to chronic psychosocial and physical stress. Um, we have, in terms of evidence from non-experimental research, we see significant links between family income, stress exposure, and biological and psychosocial indicators. And we are seeing more and more evidence uh, of these links. Um, so one of the, two of the kind of links that I want to make a comment about is stress processes that are linked to poverty include detrimental changes in bo the body's hormonal responses to prolonged stress and alterations in the immune and aging processes. So we're beginning to understand how poverty in the words of some of our students, gets under the, under the skin. Um, so we now know, for example, that boys who grow up in highly disadvantaged environments like it, that, it, that are distinguished by poverty and low maternal education um, have short, shorter telomeres than boys who grow up in advantaged environments. Telomeres are the caps on the ends of each strand of DNA, and they protect chromosomes. So telomere length is, represents cellular aging, and accelerated shortening of the telomeres is used as a biomarker of exposure to lifetime stress. Um, we also know from this research that cumulative stress exposure is, is a mediator of the link between poverty and children's psychosocial adjustment. We have some work from experimental, quasi-experimental research um, again, research that capitalizes on the natural variation in policy impl implementation suggests that there are some causal effects of income on infant and child health, physical health. So in the U.S., increases in state EITCs have been associated with improvement in birth outcomes. And we've seen, we see similar data uh, coming from Canada. It's unclear whether additional income in the case of birth outcomes made a difference because it was used, the extra money was used for nutritious food, for, um, because it reduced the stress created by economic pressure, or because of other reasons. Um, so we don't have as much research on the environmental stress perspective but I think that is where you know, the research is moving. So I want to just summarize um, points here. Experimental and causal ex ex experimental research points to causal effects of income on children's academic achievement. Links between family income and children's cognitive development and academic achievement are due in part to differences in the provision of cognitive stimulation in the home. 
within family improvements. That is the same family, longitudinal research shows the same family when they have extra income, we see a corresponding increase in the quality of the, the home environment, suggesting that low income parents use, quote, extra money in part to improve the quality of the home learning environment. Uh, decreases in family income are linked to various negative outcomes, as I said. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there and... Um, Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Now, we have two, uh, two uh, respondents who are going to offer some brief comments. I'll then moderate a discussion among the panel um, before throwing it out to you uh, to the floor. We've mic'd up, so I think, is Olivia live? First Can of all, Olivia. Me? Can you hear me? Is her mic up? Yeah, okay, it's, it's live. Late for everybody? I think you can go. Can everyone hear Olivia? Go. Okay. Olivia Golden. So it's an honor to be here with this extraordinary panel, with um, Bonnie and, and with Kathy Eden. Um, I'm going to try to make five points in my five minutes, but I, there are dozens more things <laughs> I want to say, so please ask great questions. Um, number one is that it feels to me like a particularly important moment to have a panel that's focusing on the vulnerability of children, particularly young children. Children are the poorest Americans, about one in five. Young children, the poorest within that group. Children are the most likely to be in, um, people of color of all age groups of Americans, so facing lots of other barriers. And developmentally, as you heard in the last presentation, young children in particular, but all children, um, are at a particularly vulnerable point. Um, and they're at particular risk right now in proposals from the administration and from the Congress, like the repeal of health reform and the president's proposals for 2018. So wonderful to focus on them. Second, I would say that the idea of cash or of a child allowance is an important piece of the solution, but particularly at levels like $2,000 or $3,000 a child in the US context, which as Jane pointed out is different from any other countries, it will never be more than a piece, perhaps a modest piece of the solution. And I'd say a couple headlines about that. One is that we have a growing body of research about how central Medicaid in particular, as well as SNAP, nutrition benefits, earned income tax credit, have been to children's um, well-being, and you heard, you heard some of that in the last presentation, um, Medicaid and the Affordable Care Act, both because of the importance to children of their own health coverage and because of the importance of covering parents and addressing their mental health and health needs. So research is showing, for example, long-run effects, not just on child health, but also on um, income and school completion years later. The other reason why cash is only a piece of the solution is that many of the crucial supports that children need developmentally, like health and like housing and childcare that I'm gonna talk about in a moment, um, can't easily be averaged out to a dollar figure. The family that has modest health care needs and is healthy, the family that um, has a job that is, coincides with school compared to the family that needs full-time infant child care at $16,000 or high impact health costs. So you need needs to be both and. Third point is that fixing low-wage work has to be part of the solution, too. And Kathy alluded to this, the, the extent to which low-wage work has gotten worse one of the facts that often surprises people when I report it from the census poverty st statistics is that about 70% of poor children live in a home with a worker. Yeah. So they are poor because of too low wages, because of too few hours, or because of intermittent work or a combination. So raising the minimum wage, paid family leave, paid sick days so parents don't get fired because of staying home with a child, fair scheduling are all central to the, to the solution. Fourth, I would pull out two areas where I think we ought to concentrate particularly based on the developmental evidence and the gaps we have right now, and those are childcare and early education and housing. You saw Kathy's chart about, um, about homelessness. The national statistics about homelessness show that the single most likely year to be homeless is between birth and age one, hmm. which when you think about the vulnerability of young children to instability is extraordinary. And so concentrating on those where we now reach about one in six eligible kids with childcare, one in four with housing support um, is crucial. 
And finally, I just want to highlight that um, Ron made the proposal that what we should be thinking about is all American children. About a quarter of American children today have at least one immigrant parent. And within that group, a um, bit more, about a third, five million, live in homes that have mixed status families, one or more citizen children and parents who are not. Those children are at risk from a whole set of policies right now that are um, endangering their access even to health and nutrition that they're completely legally entitled to. When we go to cash solutions like the child tax credit, it becomes even more important to protect those children's access so that their parents who want to be able to pay taxes are able to pay them and have the benefits go to citizen children. Otherwise, we won't achieve what we're trying to achieve in terms of um, the improvement of the circumstances of a very large chunk of low-income families. Thanks. Thank you. I can respond to you. Great, thank you. And thank you so much, everyone, for being so efficient in your use of time. No pressure, Ramesh. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I didn't realize it was the 50th anniversary of a previous conference on the same topic. I'd, I'd like uh, Ron and Catherine to know that I am available on May 1st, 2067, uh, <laughs> should, we, should we need to reconvene, uh, which I, I have a, a kind of depressing um, uh, nice. premonition that we may well um, <clears throat> have the same conversation. <coughs> uh, I just... I. I uh, wanted to make two main points, uh, and one of them uh, is uh, admittedly not going to be even slightly helpful, uh, and that is that uh, although you know, we're going to hear some great proposals, um, which have a lot to be said for them, uh, there is a broader context about having a, the importance of having a tight labor market um, that mm -hmm. uh, is just so vitally important and because it's sort of harder to get your arms around it, sometimes we let it slip out of our minds, uh, but it really is uh, crucial. I mean, we, over the last few decades, I, I believe we've had a full employment economy something like a third or less of the time. Uh, and you know, we're, we just make much, much more rapid progress in periods when you've got those tight labor markets. So uh, while it may not be directly on point, uh, I do think it's very important, and it has implications for everything from monetary policy to immigration. Uh, to uh, and, and we've got to keep that in mind when we think about macroeconomic policy. We're also thinking about anti-poverty policy. Um, the, the other thing I've just been thinking about, especially since I'm a, a political journalist rather than an expert in any of these social science trends, um, is the, the political context right now and whether there's an opening for addressing some of these issues. And it does seem to me that there is a small such opening. Uh, and that is the, the conversation that is currently taking place about child care. Mm. Uh, and, and particularly, we've got a, a president who campaigned on the idea of uh, expanding help um, for people who are trying to balance work and family. And I think that the proposals that um, uh, the Trump campaign came out with were, were deeply flawed. Uh, in the sense of, you know, not being thought through at all. Um, <laughs> but uh, to, to look at that optimistically, that means there is an opportunity to fill in uh, and rewrite some details in a more productive way. Uh, I think that the starting point of the conversation has essentially been um, it's so hard to find good nannies in Manhattan. Uh, and uh, <laughs> that it could be useful to broaden this conversation to include um, uh, low-income people, where I think you've and middle-income people, where you've got uh, more serious um, needs. Uh, and then the second thing that you that is notable about Trump's proposal is that he did talk about allowing stay-at-home mothers to have the same benefits as uh, uh, as women who are working, or, and, and I think that um, that too pushes in the direction of something like a cash benefit program that just benefits all parents of children. Um, again, I think it's a very small opening. Uh, one never knows how seriously any particular Trump proposal is meant, uh, but I, I think that if you're going to have any positive movement over the next couple of years, 
what you do is try to talk about a, uh, a pro-child welfare proposal that addresses child poverty and can be fit into uh, the idea of satisfying the president's campaign rhetoric. Great. Thank you very much. Your right collar has been pulled up. And as we are, you know, we have a massive audience out there. I want you to look your best. Okay, um, we have a little... the most important thing about any panel. <laughs> That's right. Um, we have a little bit of time for me to uh, in interrogate uh, or to, to bring some of these ideas together. I don't think it'll be very hard, and then we'll, then we'll pretty quickly move out to the audience. Thank you all for your comments. Uh, I see this session as being about what's the problem uh, that the other sessions are then going to come on to. So we're going to try and stay in that space as, as much as possible. I, I will note, however, that the moment that Jared Bernstein walked in the room, Ramesh started talking about the importance of tight labor markets and a full employment <laughs> economy. And I'd just like to say I wish I could have that kind of effect on policy debate. <laughs> <laughs> just w lit by walking in the room, it seemed to have that kind of magic effect. Um, so let's start, actually, almost where Kathy started and get the reactions of the panel to the kind of problem, which is you set out very strongly this idea that basically TANF's collapsed. There's, you know, the block granting led to a slush fund, uh, an opiate, and so on, and you said TANF is dead, basically. Uh, and given it's basically dead, uh, that's a great time for us to talk about something like a universal child allowance or cash replacement. Given the collapse of cash welfare, um, now's a great time to talk about it. So first question, is that a fair summary of your view? And secondly, how much of that do you think was about the block granting to the states? So in other words, if that hadn't been part of welfare reform from the beginning, and I know that many of those who are involved in welfare reform have worried about that, I'm looking a bit at Ron, um, Ron Haskins, you know, subsequently, uh, and therefore, what does that mean in terms of how we think about the design of other programs more generally? And then I'll get the other panel's response uh, yeah. as well. Can you start with that, Kathy? Yeah, so uh, the latest figures Don sent me, we have about 750,000 adults on the rolls. Um, if you count people who are just being counted by, uh, covered by state funds, I think there are about 3.8 uh, million adults and children on the rolls. So uh, I don't mean it, this in a strict numerical sense. I mean it in in a sense that welfare really has died in the imaginations of many of the poor when they hit hard times. It's not the go-to program. It's not something uh, that even occurs to many people. Many of the people we followed had never heard of the program, which seems inconceivable for those of us who have followed Tenet for a long time. Was it because of the black rods? Well, I think uh, if you had kept the entitlement, you wouldn't have seen these trends because it would have had to be responsible to changes in the labor market, which has stopped being after 2000. Um, what black grants do, though, is A, uh, they decrease in value over time, right? And B, uh, you know, if they're not monitored, states often have to make tough trade-offs, and uh, they're an easy target. Okay, thank you. Uh, Olivia, come to you, and then so I'll invite you. A couple <laughs> things. As the person who administered the TANF program 20 years ago when it was first passed, I did a long essay, or not long, a short essay on what, what I've learned and why for, um, you can find it on our website for the Shriver Center's journal as well as an op-ed in USA Today. And I would highlight a couple things and then make one other point about what else has changed cause besides TANF, because even when AFDC existed, it didn't solve all these problems. So um, the first thing I would say is that I think the block grant, in retrospect, I didn't think this at the time, was a huge part of the problem because Congress has failed to increase it. So it's gone down by 30% of value. So I think it's completely appropriate to blame states. Um, Texas reaches fewer than 10, some more like 5% of eligibles. California is one of the states that still has a program, reaches over 60%. That's about state choices. But I think it's also very important to blame the federal choice that for 20 years there was no additional investment. And from my perspective, it's very important to see that in proposals to block grant as they come up right now. So I think that that is important. Um, the second, and not to be fooled, because at the beginning, what looked positive about TANF was that there were, looked as though there were, quote, boatloads of money to invest in childcare and work training because, in fact, the block grant was initially set at a higher level. So block grants inherently fool you. Second, second thing I would say is that I think it's important to highlight the other big changes over those 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I highlighted the changes in the low-wage labor market, right, so that it's much harder for parents to, parents have, are working at hugely greater rates, but it's very difficult them, for them to support kids. The changes in who kids are, they're mm -hmm. disproportionately 
um, children of color and therefore facing a wide array of additional barriers. And then on the positive side, as Kathy noted, many other supports for those families which have contributed in important ways to well-being, but which have gotten stuck so that important pieces like housing and childcare have gotten stuck and the huge improvements under the health care legislation are at risk. So I would put all those pieces out if, there. If, let me just press you, if you knew, if we could somehow guarantee that there wouldn't be this ero erosion of value, everyone said that it's almost inevitable that, that block grants means an erosion in value. If I could somehow guarantee that. It is that, inevitable. You think when it's you inevitable? Look at them. Yes. Right. So you think it's, there's yes. no, the block grants is yes. inevitably no will get eroded. Okay. Yes. So in That's how I've changed my mind right. since 20 years ago because so I've seen it. So you wouldn't do it. Okay. Right. Uh, Bonnie or Ramesh, any additional comments mm -hmm. on block grants in these sorts of spaces? No. Ramesh? Well, I'll, the, da I'll just, the dangers of block grants, perhaps. Um, no, not, not, not specifically, just on the general question of sort of what we see as the dimensions of the problem uh, and particularly sort of what we think of as this, the state of TANF and so forth. Um, look, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, I think Scott Winship is going to be on the following panel. He's got a very different perspective on it. I found his view of poverty trends persuasive when I read it. M my main concern about that would be that we not go from the possibility that some of these things are working better than, uh, than, when, than we may think to the conclusion, therefore, we don't need to do anything additional. Uh, because I do think there's a lot that we can still do on, uh, on child poverty um, and some of these proposals that people are talking about, uh, even if you take the more optimistic view. Okay, thank you. Um, Bonnie, I wanted to uh, come back to some of your comments uh, and actually link them to some of Olivia's points. You were using, mostly in your comments, you were focusing on children. I think Kathy was too, but you were specifically yeah. right. So the outcomes, the key outcome measures were children. It was their test score results. It was mm -hmm. their subsequent earnings and so on. So it was a very sort of child-focused way of looking at the case for this kind of intervention. Um, and so I just wanted, first of all, to check that that was an appropriate uh, summary of what you were talking about and invite you to think about then the alternative ways you could spend the money. If, mm -hmm. if, the, if you're interested in child outcomes there, and you've got a certain amount of money to spend, then it, may, then it becomes an empirical question, doesn't it, whether it's better to just give cash to the family or whether, for example, you're interested in test scores, whether improved schooling or pre-K or a parenting program or uh, greater, more subsidized work. So I think about Kathy's point about the, the pride people have in, in work. And I think this speaks to Olivia's point about services and how housing, health, education, and so on. So your talk was why money matters, but you could make another argument that the goal of policy should be to make money matter less mm. in the sense of by reducing the connection between your low income and access to all these other services. You may have, and I say may, it's an empirical question, a more powerful effect on the outcomes of the kids than transferring money dollar for dollar, simply because, as you say, you know, it takes a lot, $3,000 to move the standard deviation of a test score by a fifth. I don't, I don't know whether that's a good return, but you might say you could spend that money, $3,000 on a child in a, in a way that gets you a bigger return in terms of the outcomes of the child. So I wanted to invite you first, wanted to respond to that and then see if there are other comments. Well, I can't point to any definitive research that addresses that question. Um, I'm, one point that has been made by people is that the advantage of cash over in-kind benefits is that cash is fungible, and it, it therefore one can use it in ways that uh, is responsive to the needs of the particular families. Mm. At, 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 um, mm. And so I, I, you know, I think that I'm persuaded that the fungibility of, of cash is has some advantage, and there's some evidence that. Um, uh, earning supplements and income um, are more effective than, let's say, um, as one study I think that was cited in one of the um, papers that I read, uh, is more effective in uh, improving health than Medicaid, for example. Hmm. So I think there are, it would be useful to have a better sense about what the research says about that, but I think on the face of it, there are advantages to cash mm. benefits. Not least because they can income. choose how to spend yeah. your funding. Right. Okay, Kathy, and yeah. we invite so, you and then um, Ramesh. And what we found in our ethnographic work was uh, that without a cash floor, uh, it, the, the in-kind benefits become very inefficient. For example, Ray McCormick, who I mentioned earlier, 
uh, has a host of illnesses. She's about to have a, a surgery to have an ovary removed. Uh, she has now gotten back on Medicaid, but uh, cannot afford many of her, her medications, and she only takes the medications that are covered. So imagine uh, what this looks like uh, for someone's health profile over time. So uh, if Medicaid isn't delivering the bang for the buck for Ray, it's in part because she just doesn't have this, this cash floor. Okay, so the floor, and then you, put, you can put other things on top of right. it would be your point. Yeah, so the, the, the other finding, I think, th about that is that there is this overuse of in-kind benefits uh, and underuse of um, uh, uh, things that will help advance um, various outcomes that are not being met. So, you know, when mm -hmm. people have cash in-kind benefits, they may use those and other needs end up not being being met. Ramesh, and I'll come to you. Sure, I, I would just say the, the diversity of family needs, the fungibility of money, and the possibility, the increased possibility of rent seeking with in-kind uh, benefits, mm -hmm. all in my mind combine to a very powerful presumption in favor of cash rather than in-kind benefits. It's a rebuttable presumption, but it is, I think, the presumption that ought to be there. It's, it's, yes, and I think that makes the politics of this very interesting, by the way, because it doesn't split on, on left-right lines at all. So at one extreme, you see Charles Murray being in favor of a universal basic income. And I think it is partly because there, where there are some people in the center who would say, I want to do it in a way that is more paternalistic, if you like. It should be through wage, you know, wage subsidies, or that's for childcare, that's for housing, that's for whatever whereas both left and right of different kinds are happier just to say, here's the money, and then it's fungible, so you can choose how to use it. So there's a kind of, there's an, the, the politics of this are, are not straightforward, as I think you just identified. So clearly. To me, the evidence... You were talking a lot about services. Yeah, it felt no, to me like you were... I mean, I think that um, in the end, the answer is going to have to be a combination, right? Children and families will not benefit if um, they can't get health care or they get evicted because they have a little bit of cash, but it doesn't solve those problems. Um, so to me, where you start is partly about the world at that moment. And right now, the core health care benefit is threatened, so protecting that comes next and making it be effective. Um, I actually feel very worried about the threats to housing, which I think uh, it's hard for me when I think about the developmental research to think about a worse thing for a baby than being evicted. And so I do think that's central. If along the way there came a moment when you could get the refundable children's tax credit without ha facing at the same time a huge cut in public revenues from a damaging tax bill, of course I'd seize it. So I, I actually think that it's about fitting the pieces together. And two other quick things. One is that many of the proposals, the way they spread dollars out um, that I think trade-offs are important to talk about is pro, um, initiatives that are universal or near universal are obviously spending a great deal of money on um, middle and higher income families. Yeah. And because inequality among children is so important, that's a question for me. Again, it's not a question that's totally resolved, but if you're asking me where to trim back, it would not be cut Medicaid but give somebody a child allowance. It would be consider whether you really need to focus um, on what's nearly half of children who right. are growing up below twice the poverty level. I mean, we, we face a situation where we're not investing enough in total in our future because we haven't responded to how, it, how insecure half of families with kids are. So you worry a little bit about the universal side Absolutely. of uh, child allowance in some ways not being the best use of resources because it's not going to the people who most need it. That's a, a fair summary. Uh, I'll try and ask one, one more very quick question to the panel, and then we'll kind of open up, which is about this early years point. I think it was you on it that said that you, a lot of your it's zero to five yes. is where a lot of uh, the action is, both in right. terms of impact and homelessness, kind of et cetera. And so I just wanted to invite everyone on the kind of panel to reflect on um, the, the, how far up the age range such an allowance might go, where we should be focusing our resources, and whether there's a case for a, a different level of allowance or a specific investment in those kinds of early years. Um, given everything I heard, there's quite a strong case for saying those are the years you'd want to do it. Maybe even, maybe even universally, I don't know, because for various reasons, but, but the stretching it up to 16, 18, obviously a much more expensive proposition, and, maybe, and that would make it thinner. So, um, Kathy, why don't you go yeah, first? Yeah, so I'd that? like to go to housing. You know, we have about a quarter of all eligible families uh, in the United States have a housing subsidy, uh, but most of those families were on a list uh, for years and years and years, or... Uh, you know, the list opened up briefly and they, they won a lottery. 
And so young children uh, are vulnerable not only because they're young, <laughs> but because uh, the housing burden on their parents is the most likely to be high. Ramesh, any thoughts on this, whether it should be focused on the early years as opposed to all children? I, I think there is a strong case for, uh, for, for having a larger subsidy or allowance for younger children. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to throw out <laughs> something else. I, I think that uh, we need to start by, uh, by improving what we've got. Okay. Yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't propose that there not be a child allowance for children over six. I would say that I, I think there's support for having a larger child allowance uh, from zero to six or five, uh, partly because uh, income for, of parents uh, of children this age tends to be lower because they are younger, they have less um, work history, et cetera, et cetera. So taking that into account, that is the increased stress that parents with children this age are under, in addition to the fact that uh, the economic conditions for children under age five seem to be more important to their long-term uh, outcomes, for me, that would suggest uh, a child allowance that is graduated. Like a step. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll leave it, then we'll go. I just want to invite everybody on Wednesday, the Georgetown Center for Poverty and Inequality and the University of Michigan in CLASP are doing a session precisely on um, what's the right set of solutions from cradle to kindergarten in the title of the book. Um, and I would say that across the whole portfolio of solutions, we need to look a lot at the unique birth to five circumstances, the vulnerability of kids and of their parents, and the, ver the extraordinary difficulty of maintaining low wage work while also caring for a baby or a toddler. To me, that doesn't necessarily have an implication in the dollar amount of the child allowance, but it does mean it's a different portfolio of strategies and we need to pay a lot of attention. Very good, right, we're gonna um, open up for questions. I'll just make two quick comments, one is that in the UK, it was very different to take a universal child benefit and then means test out the most affluent than to have a test that's means testing in the poor. So it's, it does have a very different political feel to it. Not that it was uncontroversial, or, or I'm not even saying it was the right or the wrong thing to do, but by having something that's universal and saying, yes, but those at the top don't need it, is rather different to just saying only poor people who can prove their poverty in some way get it. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing, just in the spirit of this conversation, your questions, is I think we're all well aware that this is not uh, necessarily an imminent legislative um, achievement. Um, <laughs> the people who've been arguing for this are kind of used to it being a long game, and I say that partly in seriousness because there are lots of uh, more pressing concerns, and I think Olivia's kind of mentioned a couple, but I think the spirit of our conversation here is that actually having kind of good and broad ideas from all sides of the political spectrum is very important um, kind of as we go forward. So I think that's the, the spirit of this, certainly this session. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'll invite comments. There are microphones. Uh, Allegra, would you mind bringing it to this lady here? And anybody else? Hands up so we can then, actually the gentleman next to you, sir. Very good thank afternoon. You. Thank you very much. Um, it is expensive to be poor. And I wonder if um, the likes of you all perhaps need to do, to do more to underscore that if you live in downtown Baltimore, uh, the freshest place to get milk may be a liquor store um, or a 7-Eleven. But if you live in north of Townsend, you get to go to Costco. So I want to suggest to you all that people seem to think that poor people are poor because they don't manage things right. And in fact, it's arguable that it is because they're in their environment, mm -hmm. whether it's rent or food, things are more expensive. And that if you're upper middle class, in an upper middle class area, you actually spend less on food than they do. So um, I feel, again, you can tell me I'm wrong, tell all these people I'm wrong, but it is expensive to be poor. And maybe like the breadbasket thing that used to happen in the 70s with inflation, that someone, an intern goes out on the three bus line in Baltimore and buys formula, diapers, milk, I don't know what, um, and then goes and buys it somewhere else and compare. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm going to tell you that you're right, just in case everyone else tells you that you're wrong. Um, to the extent that I think that when we think about income poverty, we, we tend to focus on the income and the resource side and not on the cost side. Yeah. But of course, if everything was free, 
no one will be poor. And so the cost, the cost of thing, and the cost of credit, the cost of telecommunications, the cost of transport, and so on, is something we don't spend enough time on. And one of the reasons why I think it would be good to spend more time on that in these poverty debates is that you, can, you might be able to build a, a broader political coalition around it. Because very often, the reason why the poor are coming is because the markets aren't working very effectively for one reason or another. And so there's kind of space for potential kind of market-based solutions that will lower the cost of some of the kind of key items that therefore means you're less poor, even if, even if we haven't managed to increase your income. So anyway, with that, I just wanted to say, <laughs> I, think, I think you're right. <laughs> now let's see if everyone else thinks you're right too. Let's start with you, Ramesh. Let's come all the way, let's come down this way. Go on, Ramesh. Um, I think that that is uh, absolutely, you know, when we've been talking about the poor pay more for decades, um, the, uh, on this idea of the possibility of, le of left-right coalitions, I do think the cost of housing, particularly in some regions of the country, is something that we have seen more attention to from both liberals and conservatives is something that could be tackled, but there are some very serious political economy problems that are standing in the way of our addressing those problems. Yeah, I agree. Catherine. I want to amplify this point. So, uh, you know, I've spent my career uh, hanging out with folks uh, who are poor and, and talking to them about their budgets. <laughs> And uh, what, what is amazing to me is, is how skilled many poor people are at economic survival. Uh, we did a study for the USDA looking at 90 food stamp households. And the degree to the skill involved in managing on a food stamp budget is astonishing. Uh, so you see, that's kind of like a regular thing that happens to folks who do what I do is you're, you're like, oh, how can they? They're so amazing at you know, budgeting for food. But, uh, what I think Sindel Molinathan and Eldar Shafir, uh, two psychologists, have keep clued us into is there's a huge tax on one's cognitive b bandwidth for doing that. So uh, the space that's taking up, taken up surviving uh, is to the detriment of, other, uh, of, of one's cognitive load. And it's much harder then to focus on tasks uh, that may lead to mobility from poverty. Bonnie. I would just add that the um, cost of being poor is exacerbated if you're African American. And I don't know about Latino, but I, I know that the, the research certainly suggests that race uh, exacerbates um, that problem okay. because of racial segregation in part, community segregation. Yeah. And transport access. And right. Social right. And I would just add, I also agree, and I would say that another thing that exacerbates it is the disproportionate share of poor people and of black and Latino people raising kids while in low wage jobs with the rigidity in terms of time. So it's both that things cost money and that the ability to, to, do, to do anything, to get somewhere, to buy on the sale or whatever it is, is sharply constrained by the ways in which you'll lose your job or be docked pay. The gentleman there, I think already has the mic, but no, there you go. Thanks. Uh, two questions, actually. Uh, the first is, do you have any data or explanations for why, uh, given how expensive it is to raise children, why so many poor people actually have kids, why, why they would add that stressor? Um, and the second part is, rather than providing some sort of universal credit, why not provide a dollar-for-dollar uh, dollar, uh, tax credit to taxpayers who actually just provide money uh, for programs or services outright? So that they have a little bit of control over so where the money is actually going. Yeah, it's very quiet. I don't have the microphones on. I got the first one. The second one is rather than a Ra rather than essentially rather than uh, having some sort of subsidized program where you're then providing money to people for whatever. Why not allow taxpayers to actually just provide funds directly and then give them uh, some sort of credit or okay. tax deduction? All right, very good. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, just a couple of minutes left for the panel. So. If, please don't feel you, you will have to answer both of those questions, but um, please do if you want to. And then any final thoughts? This is probably our last round um, before we have to kind of close this panel. I'm going to go this way and then uh, along from here. So, let's start so on the your, first one... Did you all hear the, both questions? On the first one, there had been dramatic reductions in birth rate for everybody, including poor people and particularly young um, teenagers and young adults. Um, so there have been reductions in birth rate. There have been increases in workforce participation. The way I think of it is... Families are doing everything they can do. The problem is the labor market and the public framework isn't supporting them in raising kids. I would say second, and I'm going to leave the second question to others, but uh, I think the other thing I would say is that these kids are our future. If we didn't have them, if it, we would be an aging society like Japan. So the fact that half of children are in struggling households where there's a lot of work, but they're below twice the poverty level, 
is a very, it would be better for us if th those families were more economically secure, but it would not be better for us if we had only a highly aging, um, well-off population no longer in an age range to have kids and fewer kids. So from my perspective, the kids are, an, are crucial to our future. Right, thank you. Bonnie. Either, both, <laughs> or neither, or a pass. <laughs> Well, I think children bring great enjoyment to uh, to parents. Uh, most of the time. Most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. I, That's the most yeah. controversial thing that anyone's <laughs> said so far. <laughs> <laughs> but but parenting is a very emotional experience. You 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 enjoy your children, but they also drive you crazy. So it's not just a financial decision, in other words. No, people aren't doing the cost benefit not, analysis. It's and, not, and that's yeah. probably a good thing. Yeah. Otherwise. Um, <laughs> what? What? So I can see yeah, very like, American uh, dad. Yeah, it's very interesting. I bet Kathy's got something to say on that. I've written a, a book on this topic, uh, <laughs> asking people uh, why uh, they have children. And I wrote an essay with Christopher Jenks a couple of years ago called uh, Do Poor People Have the Right to Bear Children? So very much to your point. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, we do see in, in our ethnographic work that uh, children are a key source of meaning and identity and, and closely linked uh, to all kinds of pro-social behaviors. Uh, we know that men who parent and men who actively parent see lower rates of testosterone, which is, of course, linked to so, uh, uh, more pro-social behavior. Um, but uh, what we argue, what uh, Fanny Jenks and I argue in our essay is that uh, in, a, in a world where if you play by the rules, you still can't afford a child, that is a world uh, that is irresponsible uh, to you. So, uh, and, and that's what's happening with many of our families. They are playing by the rules to the best of their ability, but they still cannot afford to bear children. And we argue that they have the right to do so. Okay. Ramesh, finish us off. Uh, so on that second <coughs> question, which I'm going to sort of reformulate as why not tax reduction instead of spending programs, I, I'm all for it, is my answer. <laughs> Uh, and in particular, I think that payroll tax relief um, f uh, is something that we ought to explore. But uh, it, it, you know, we have, of course, uh, tax deduction for people who give to organizations that combat poverty. There, and we can, we should think about changing some of those. I think that it makes a certain amount of sense to to convert that into a credit, a flat credit that uh, uh, doesn't depend on your income um, for the value of that deduction. Um, but, and I think that's a very important part, actually, of the American safety net, but it, it can't be, of course, the entirety of it. We're now into um, how we might design such a policy and what the pros and cons of that design would be, so it's almost as if we planned it, because that's a perfect segue to the next uh, <laughs> panel session. Uh, we are tweeting at hashtag child allowance. Uh, we are going to have a five-minute break as the next panel is set up. Just five minutes, but now is the perfect time to grab a drink, restroom, and please join me in thanking our panel, not least Kathy, who's running away. <laughs> <laughs>